All right. Um, welcome back. After learning that Texas does not have a power grid, welcome back to class. Hope, hope everyone is doing well. Um, so just some, some clerical business to begin with. Uh, so the test has been moved back. So test one is this Friday and the folders I've moved back as well. So I've gone through and redated folders that I needed to and changed the due dates of those assignments in those folders. Um, so as always, if you're confused when something is due, when it comes to quizzes and reading guides, um, the date in the folder will tell you when it's due. Um, and I just put up an announcement uh, today about the homework that's originally due on Sunday. Uh, still had some people having issues, um, you know, just got power back a couple days ago. Um, so I decided to extend those until tonight. Um, after that, no more extensions because those that homework, you actually had all week before the storm to do it. Um, so yeah, uh, that's going to be my final extension on, on that. Yes, test one is on this Friday now, correct. Um, because the whole week was canceled. All right, so with that, um, let's, let's move forward then. Um, what we're gonna cover on today and Wednesday is not going to be on test one. Um, so um, no need to study for this for the upcoming test on Friday. And what we're gonna look at is we're gonna look at reaction stoichiometry. Now, last week uh, we learned about balancing equations, um, how to look at an equation and using the stoichiometric coefficients. Remember these, what I'm talking about are the numbers in front, right? So just as a reminder, these numbers say how many molecules are reacting or moles. So these represent moles or molecules. They're called stoichiometric coefficients, right? And what this says in plain English is that two molecules or two moles of octane plus 25 moles of oxygen make 16 moles of carbon dioxide and 18 moles of water vapor. And we're going to use stoichiometry to figure out um, different questions relating to chemistry. And that's what we're going to get into today. So let's start. Um, since we covered balancing last week, I'm going to let you have a um, couple minutes here and try to balance uh, the equation because balancing will be on our exam. So see if you can balance uh, 1A, and then I will go on and show you how to determine 1B. So um, here is a question timer I have for us. Um, this relates to 1A. So tell me, you know, uh, if when you get finished with 1A, if you're confident, not sure, or if you got part of the way with 1A and then got stuck, or you have no idea what is going on with 1A, feel free to answer uh, right away. But I'll give everybody a few minutes to try this.
while you're still working on that, I'm just gonna uh, get it uh, set up so I can uh, solve it faster. Okay, so carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. Oops, that's uh, not a great line, reactant products. All right, so it seems some people are uh, finishing up. Um, it looks like we have a good spread of uh, finished and confident, but we also have some people not quite sure. Um, so, so let me get to solving now. So remember, left side of the arrows, reactants, right side's products. So the first thing you need to do is just simply count. Um, so six reactants, uh, what's that? 14 hydrogens, two oxygens. On the right, one, uh, two, three. All I did there, was count the um, number of atoms, right, on each side of the arrow. Now your job's a balance. So six carbons on the left, one carbon on the right. That's an easy fix. Just put a six right there. That goes to six carbons. Then not to count the number of oxygens. Six times two is 12, plus one is 13. All right. So now my carbons are balanced. 14 hydrogens on the left. Two on the right, again, that's an easy fix. Just multiply everything on the right by seven. Go to, oops, sorry. Got myself a uh, new writing tablet. Still getting used to it. Uh, 14 there. So seven times one is seven plus 12 is 19. All right. Here's where the tricky thing happens and where historically a lot of people got confused on. I have 19 oxygens on the right, two on the left. And you, when doing stoichiometric coefficients, you cannot put a decimal. So there is no possible way to make my oxygens balance out currently. All right, there's no way to get 19 oxygens on the left. So what you have to do when you run into this situation, you have to unbalance something you've already balanced. And what I, what I did here is I took this C6H12 and just said I have two of these molecules instead of one. When I do that, my carbon go to 12, my hydrogen go to 28 on the left-hand side. The whole reason I did that is because I ran into the situation where oxygen could never be balanced. So just be aware when balancing equations, if you run into an impossible situation like this, just unbalance something and see if you can work it out from there. Now to rebalance everything. So carbon is 12 on the left, six on the right, make that 12. So that goes to 12. And then I have 12 times two is 24 plus seven is 31 oxygens. Now my hydrogen at the rebalance, so instead of seven, that's gonna be uh, 14. 14 times two is 28. So my hydrogen is balanced. 14 times one is 14 oxygen plus 24 oxygen. So 14 plus 24 is 38. So it'll give me 38 oxygen. Now I'm in a situation where I have an even number of oxygen on the right, even number on the left. So it's easy to balance. Now I'll just put 19 because 19 times two equals 38. That is a balance equation. Um, that is more complex than what we saw um, um, lat, well, what, two weeks ago now, um, but hopefully you could at least get that started um, and, and work through it. And now that you saw it, hopefully understand the logic. So is there any questions 
um, how I solve that problem before I move on to B. All right, so B, B is a giant conversion problem. And what I'm saying is that if I start with 7.2 moles of C6H14, how many moles of O2 do I get? So my conversion I'm really doing is converting between C6H14 to O2, or how many moles of O2 do I need to use rather? And our conversion factor, when you are going for different um, molecules in a reaction, some things you have to note, you have to be in moles. When converting from one molecule to another, like we're doing in this problem, you have to be in moles. You cannot convert in anything else but moles. And your conversion factor, are our stoichiometric coefficients. So our conversion factor is what we just figured out. We said, based on our balancing, for every two moles of C6H14 we have, we need to react that with 19 moles of O2. So I'm gonna set up a train track to do this conversion for us. So I have 7.2 moles of C6H14. This is moles. Now for every two moles of C6H14 I have, I need 19 moles of O2 to react with that. So my moles of C6H14 cancel out. I'm left in moles of O2. Again, I got the two and the 19 for my coefficients. And now I just do the train track. So I take 7.2 multiplied by 19 divided by two. And I get, I need 57.6 moles of O2, or if I do my uh, correct rounding with my sig figs, I get eight, 58 moles of O2. So I need 58 moles of O2 to react with that much hexane in this chemical reaction. Again, that comes from our stoichiometric coefficients for my balance equation. All right. So is there any questions with how we solve B? Like, did I lose anyone anywhere? Someplace you got confused? So let's see if you did understand it. I want, I already balanced the equation for you. I want you to tell me how many moles of NO2 form when 2.87 kilograms of N2O5 react completely. If we were given a question like this, will we be given an equation to balance first? Um, you could expect that, yes. Uh, I'm not saying 100%. If I give you a question like that, I would expect you to balance it first, but I'm not saying I wouldn't either. So um, I would plan, well, this stuff will be on test two and balancing was on test one. So I expect you to know balancing all, already. So yes, it is fair for me to ask you something like that. That's how I'd answer that. Not saying I will do that, but I'm saying possibly it could be. 
All right, let me get my little timer up again. So C, whoops, there we go. Yay, new timer up. See if you can tell me if we have 2.87 kilograms of N2O5, how many moles of NO2 do we form? You have questions as always, feel free to let me know. All right, so looks like we have um, some people that are finished, some people who are able to start it, but wasn't quite sure. So, um, and looks like I missed some questions here. Uh, is it 5740 moles or 5.7 times 10 to the four? Um, this for, if you wanted to go straight the moles, your moles should, should be in scientific notation. So your moles should have, um, only three digits with it. So 5.74 times 10 to the three would be the correct notation there. All right, so let's let's take a look at this. So we start in, the, in this problem, let's just write down the big thing, right? I start with N2O5. So I say I have 2.87 kilograms of N2O5. I want to know how many moles of NO2 do I make, right? Remember, the way to convert between one molecule and another is moles. And your conversion factors are these coefficients. So for every two moles of N2O5, I make four moles of NO2. So this is a giant conversion. And I start in a weight. So I start with weight of uh, N2O5. And remember, if you're started with a weight to get to moles, 
which we need to be in, we need to calculate the molecular weight. Again, something we looked at two weeks ago and something that will be on test one, how to calculate a molecular weight. So we look in our periodic table for N2O5. So there's two nitrogens. So two times the weight of nitrogen, which is 14.007. Again, depending on what periodic table you look at, your numbers will be slightly different than mine. Plus, now we have to do oxygen. We have five oxygens multiplied by the weight of oxygen, 15.998. So the weight of N2O5 is 107.959 grams per mole. If I was doing sig figs, it should be one, two, three, four, five. So I would say 107.96, right? Let's do this conversion. Um, when doing big conversions like this, I always start with the number that I'm given. So I start with 2.87 kilograms of N2O5. Now, our molecular weight is in grams to mole, so I need to convert from kilograms to grams. Again, a skill that we uh, should know for our test one coming up here on Friday, one kilogram is 1,000 grams. And this is all N2O5. So kilograms cancel out. Now I'm in grams of N2O5, right? Now, since I'm in grams, I can go to moles. So for every 107.95 grams of N2O5 I have, I have one mole of N2O5. Again, that's what molecular weight says. So grams cancel out. Now I'm in moles of N2O5. And once you're in moles, you can move between different molecules. So our coefficients say for every two moles of N2O5 I have, that makes four moles of NO2. And let me just get rid of my pull. Now it's just a giant calculation. Multiply everything at the top divided by everything at the bottom. And let me just say, um, I, I think I said it like uh, uh, two weeks ago, but I'll, I'll say it again. If in your calculator, you put 2.87 times 1,000 times one times four divided by 107, 0.95 times two. If you don't put any parentheses, the order of operations is going to do multiply that two together, get an answer. Multiply that two together, get an answer. Divide it all by 107.95 and get an answer. Then multiply it all by two, which is incorrect. So make sure on your calculator you're using your parentheses correctly. Everything at the top should be in parentheses together divided by everything on the bottom should be its own set of parentheses. When we do this, we should get, uh, you have 53.3 moles of NO2. At least that's what I calculated. All right, any questions? about how we can use our stoichiometric coefficients to figure out um, different problems in chemistry, going from one molecule to another, starting with a uh, certain amount of, of our starting material. Uh, did I lose anyone or anyone was unsure with a, a specific step? As I did see in the poll, a lot of people got stuck at a certain point.
why didn't you just work it out like the last problem and change the kilograms to grams? I am confused what that means. I did change the kilograms to grams, right? I changed the kilograms to grams right here. Let me just go back to the last problem. Determine, um, so the last problem I started in moles, right? So here I had to go to moles. I started with kilograms and you cannot convert from kilograms to another molecule. So I convert from kilograms to moles, if that's what you're asking. All right, um, so let's erase it. So I, I will advise people, like if you get to the point of like, like so on the poll I have the answer, um, I got to a certain point, but then got stuck. Feel free to send me in chat where you're stuck at. And I can type you a message of like, uh, maybe you should uh, do this point to see if you can work through. Um, but anyways, let's continue on then. Now let's get to the thing that, I don't know, 80% of people seem not to understand. So if there's one point to focus in on today, it's this. So get your listening caps on for like five minutes. It's limiting reactant, theoretical yield, uh, percent yield, all that good stuff. Yeah. And let's just go through some definitions. Limiting reactant. In a chemical equation, a limiting reactant is the reactant that runs out first. A theoretical yield is if you use everything you could, how much product would you get? I'm going to skip ahead here. Okay, so I'm going to explain this in terms of pizza because every chemistry book does. So let's say... I'm making a pizza and my chemical equation for a pizza is one crust plus five pepperoni plus two units of cheese, not two units of cheese equal or go to rather one pizza, one sauceless pizza. All right. Let's say I, in, in my kitchen, I have 10 units of crust. I have 20 units of pepperoni and I have 80 units of cheese. I just have a ton of cheese because I love cheese. All right, based on my chemical equation that I just wrote here and based on my starting reactants, What's gonna run out first when I make my pizzas? Are my is the crust gonna run out first? Is the pepperoni gonna run out first, or is the cheese gonna run out first? Who can tell me what is gonna run out first? My pepperoni. Pepperoni is my limiting rea reactant. Okay, that that's easy enough, right? What's my theoretical yield? Based on my starting amounts, how many pizzas can I make? And remember, I have to have all this for one pizza. Like we're not making cheese pizzas here. We're making pepperoni pizzas. You can only make five, 10, 15, 20. You can only make four pizzas. My theoretical yield is four pizzas. See, this is a super simple concept. When you see the same concept, but I'm replacing pepperoni with C2O5, don't let your brain shut down because you don't know what C2O5 means. It's just a molecule. The idea of limiting reactant and theoretical yield is as easy as this pizza example I'm giving you. The only difference coming up is I'm gonna replace crust, pepperoni, and cheese in pizza with chemicals. But the idea is 100% the same. So keep that in mind if you feel like you're gonna panic. Think about pizza. 
And if it helps, feel free to cross out the chemical names and put pizza crust, whatever. It's, it will work out the same. All right, so here's a question for you. I have a chemical reaction, two moles of sodium plus one mole of bromine make two moles of sodium bromide. If in A, I start with two moles of sodium and one mole of bromine, what's my limiting reactant in theoretical yield? In B, it's the same idea, but I'm starting in grams here. What's my limiting reactant? What's my theoretical yield, All right? So I will pop up the poll and, and the question timer here relates to 1A. Remember, you, you just saw the same example with pizza. So don't, don't forget how to do it just because I say sodium now. So tell me, what's my limiting reactant and theoretical yield for A? If you're not sure what the math is, just remember, what was the math you did in your head to figure it out in the pizza example? It's the same exact math, 100%. All right, All right, so it seems like we got a good proportion of people um, doing uh, have A. So let's do this. So I start with 2.5 moles of sodium. So if I have 2.5 moles of sodium, how much sodium bromide can I make? Well, my stoichiometry coefficients say for every two moles of sodium, I make two moles of sodium bromide. So I can make 2.5 moles of sodium bromide. Now I need to do the same calculation with bromine. If I start with one mole of bromine, mole, and I want to know how much sodium bromide I can make, well, my coefficients say for every one mole of bromine I make, or I have, I make two moles of sodium bromide. So if I start with one mole of bromine, I can make two moles of sodium bromide. That means bromine is my limiting reactant because my bromine is going to run out first before my sodium does because I make less amount of sodium bromide with that. And my theoretical yield is two moles of sodium bromide. With these starting conditions, the maximum amount of sodium bromide I can make is two because my bromine will run out and then I'll be, I'll have no bromine left. Just like in the previous example, my pepperoni runs out. I can no longer make pizza. 
Same idea, I'm just using chemicals now. All right, questions about A. Let me relaunch the poll for B then. Well, this one's for B, but if you have questions about A, please do let me know. Otherwise, we're gonna give you a couple minutes for a B. You got the same answer, but you didn't write out the train tracks. Yeah, so A is probably super easy to do in your head. Um, B would probably be harder, but if you have a way to do it, the train tracks is just how I uh, keep that information um, correct. You don't have to use them. That's just the way I do them. Like I would never like, penalize anybody for not using my method if you still get, sort of, still get the right answer using a different method. All right, so we have some people finishing up and for the sake of time, um, I will go on. Um, if you're still working, feel free to uh, continue. So we're starting in grams here. Remember, whenever we are going from one molecule to another, and we are here because we want to know how much sodium bromide we're making, um, we always have to be in moles. Yay. So we need to find molecular mass, sodium, periodic table, has a molecular mass of 22.990 grams per moles. Br2, you take two times the weight of Br, and this is 159.808 grams per mole Br2. All right? Now, with that, we are all ready to go. And I'm going to erase A here. Let's go straight into B. So same idea. If I start with 289.7 grams of sodium, how much sodium bromide can I make? Well, I need to be in moles. So I'm gonna convert grams of sodium to moles of sodium. So 22.990 grams of sodium for one mole of sodium. Then I can use my moles um, to figure out how much sodium bromide I make. So every two moles of sodium I have, I make two moles of sodium bromide. Moles of sodium have canceled out, grams of so sodium have canceled out. I'm left in moles of sodium bromide. And doing that math, you make 12.60 gram, or sorry, not grams, moles of sodium bromide. So th that's how much sodium bromide we can make with our st uh, starting sodium amounts. How about our starting bromine amounts? So I start with 501.3 grams of bromide. For every 159.808 grams, I get one mole of bromide. Then my mole to mole ratio, right? One mole of bromide makes two moles 
of sodium bromide. Units cancel out, so I know I did my math right. Multiply everything at the top, divided by everything at the bottom, and I get 6.900 moles of sodium bromide. So even though the weight of bromine is bigger, it is our limiting reactant because we make less sodium bromide with it because it runs it, and so it'll run out first. And our theoretical yield is 6.9 moles of sodium bromide. So just keep that in mind too. This is something I see people get wrong all the time and I'm not quite sure why, but your theoretical yield is always from your limiting reactant, right? So on a test, if you say something is a limiting reactant, then your theoretical yield is coming from that limiting reactant. I often see people say the correct limiting reactant, but I don't know where they pull the theoretical yield out from. So just keep that in mind. All right, any questions? about how we do three here. And this is one area where I can easily find additional questions online um, about limiting reactant and theoretical yield. All right, if not, I can move on. Last thing we're gonna talk about is actual yield and percent yield. So theoretical yield, which we just calculated, is the maximum amount you can get in a chemical reaction. However, in reality, reactions never go to 100% completion. Like you're never gonna use up all the reactant you have. It never, it's never gonna happen. So the actual amount of product that you get, that you measure, we call that actual yield. And we have something called percent yield. Percent yield is the actual amount you got divided by what you theoretically should have got times 100% actual divided by theoretical times 100%. And do note that it is possible to get over 100% yield. That just means something went wrong in your experiment. But um, some things I, something I do like to do on, on a test, I've done it before, is I'll set up a question like this and the percent yield will actually be over 100%. I just want to see if, if you actually know the equation and trust yourself enough to say what the answer should be. Um, but yeah, let's let's get into this. Let's let's take a look at this. So calculate percent yield for the following reaction if, and I have three scenarios here, A, B, and C. Um, so I will start with A and then allow you to uh, tackle B and C, and we'll call class after that. So A, so I have a theoretical yield of 28.4 grams of sodium bromide, but I actually got 18.3. What's my percent yield? So remember it's actual divided by theoretical times 100%. So my actual is 18.3 grams. Theoretical is 28.4 grams multiplied by 100%. And we get that my percent yield is 64.4%. Pretty straightforward. Um, do note that your units don't have to be in grams. When doing this calculation, your units can be anything as long as the units at the top and the bottom or the units of actual and theoretical are the same. As shown in B and C, in B and C, I give you different units and want you to correct or, or calculate percent yield. So try to do B and C here. 
And uh, if you have questions, let me know. Otherwise, I'll be back in a uh, few minutes uh, to wrap up and show you how these are done so you can uh, check your answers. All right, let's go through these. Um, so for B, I give you something in grams and give you something else in moles. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna convert the moles to grams. Um, you could go the other way. You can convert grams to moles. It doesn't matter. You'll get the same answer. So I have 0.298 moles of sodium bromide. And my molecular weight is for every one mole of sodium bromide I have, that is 102.84 grams of uh, bromide, or sodium bromide, which means I get 30.7 grams of sodium bromide. So actual is 30.7. Theoretical is 32, multiply that by 100. And my percent yield here is 95.8%. And in C, I have a thing in moles and a thing in atoms. So I'm gonna convert atoms to moles using Avogadro's number. Again, something that uh, hopefully you know by now because it will be on test one. So I have 5.23 times 10 to the 23 atoms. And Avogadro's number is 6.022 times 10 to the 23 atoms for every one mole. And so the number of moles I have with this amount of atoms is 0.868 moles of sodium bromide. That's my actual. And my theoretical is one. So that, that math is rather easy. It's 0.868 divided by one times 100%. So my theoretical yield is 86.8%.
All right. Now that you've seen that worked out, are there any last minute questions um, about our theoretical yield, percent yield, or any of the fun topics we cover today? I believe, oops. Yeah, that's the last question of the slideshow, perfect. All right. Well, if always, if you have questions, please email me. Um, otherwise, um, yeah, I will see you Wednesday, hopefully. I'll put a homework up, as always. Uh, and good luck on Friday. See everybody later. <laughs>